Hello everyone, welcome back. In this module, we're going to talk about interest rate and also uh, the different characteristics and pretty much everything that you need to know about interest rate. So we're going to talk about different definitions and interest rate can be confusing if you don't know the uh, industry lingo on how they use different interest rate to describe different products. Um, we'll also look at a concept called compounding and how does that impact the actual interest that you pay. And finally, we're going to look at different factors in the economy and also individual characteristics that affect interest rate. So let's get started. So we all understand interest, but then when we look at a financial contract or a loan contract or a credit card application, there are so many different terms. And what do they really mean? First, let's take a look at a couple of very common ones. Uh, one is APY. This is, stands for annual percentage yield. So the APY. And this is an interest rate that takes into account compounding. We will talk about compounding in a minute. The next very common uh, term that you may hear in financial products are APRs, and this stands for annual percentage rate. The annual percentage rate includes fees, but does not take into account compounding. Annual percentage yield takes into account compounding, but oftentimes does not take into account fees. So let's take a look at a simple example. Let's say, let's f ignore fees for the time being because that can complicate uh, calculation. Uh, you have a credit card and the balance is due each month. The fact that the payment is due each month translate into monthly compounding. So the term compounding really means how often do you make payment. So if you make payment once a month, you have monthly compounding. If you make payment every other week, then you have bi-weekly compounding and so forth. When you have a compounding frequency that is more frequent than once per year, the APR and the APY, so the annual percentage rate and the annual percentage yield, are different. So a 20% APR is equivalent to a 26.82% APY. Financial institutions typically advertise APY on savings and investment products such as CDs, savings account, and then they'll advertise APR on loan products. Why do you think that is the case? As we said earlier, when we have monthly compound, when we have compounding that's more often than once per year, APY will be higher than APR. So when you're offering savings, you want to show a higher percentage rate to the customers. And then when you are um, selling a loan, you want to show your borrower a slightly lower percentage rate. So both of them are accurate in terms of interest rate, but they have different definitions and they represent uh, different information. To help you understand uh, what's going on, let's take a look at how the annual percentage yield is computed. So in other words, we're going to look at the impact of compounding. Uh, compounding is a term that we use to describe earning interest on interest. So when we have compounding, the interest is based on the beginning balance of each period rather than the initial amount that you borrow. Another name for APY, annual percentage yield, is called the effective annual yield or an effective annual rate. So those are terms that you will see quite often. So let's first take a look at an example. Let's say we're working with $100,000 at 8% per year. If there's no compounding, um, then in one year, the interest will be $100,000 times 8% which is 0.08, so 8% convert into a percentage is 0.08, 100,000 times 0.08 will be $8,000 in one year. So we are working with one year for the time being, to make things simple. So this is if there's no compounding. So let's say what happened if there is compounding. So in this particular example, we assume that it's quarterly. 
So quarterly means four times per year because there are four quarters per year. So it's the same problem. We have $100,000. Uh, the interest rate is 8% per year. So assume if there's no fee, then this will be your APR. So, but you are paying interest, on, you are computing interest on a quarterly basis, and there are four quarters per year. So when you take 8% divided by 4, you get 2% per quarter. So 8% per year becomes 2% per quarter. That pretty straightforward. And your beginning balance is $100,000. So in the first quarter, so these are all quarters. In the first quarter, the interest is $100,000 times 2% converted into a decimal is 0 0.02. So you get the interest of $2,000. Now, because you didn't pay anything, you're going to add the interest to next year. So $100,000 plus $2,000, your new balance for the next quarter, at the end of the first quarter, is $102,000. And we're going to continue doing that. Now you, uh, you continue to compound. So the next quarter, the, be the balance for the next quarter beginning is $102,000. Once again, you multiply that by 2%, because it's 2% per quarter, you get $2,040 as interest for the second quarter. And the ending balance for the second quarter is $102,000 plus $2,040. So you have an ending balance after the second quarter of $104,040. So you do the same thing again. The next quarter, you start with $104,040 times 2%, and you get uh, $2,080.80. And we add that to the balance, and now it goes up to $106,120.80, rounding up to $121. We do that one more time. So it was $106,121 times 0 0.02. We got $2,122.42. So that's how we compute interest expense with compounding. And here, again, we're working with quarterly compounding. If you add up all the interest, so you add up all four years interest, or four quarters, I'm sorry, if you have all four quarters interest, you have $8,243.22. So that is how we come up with our API, our annual percentage yield. So we divide the $8,243, and that by the original amount that we borrow, which is $100,000. So we borrow $100,000, and over a year, which is four quarters, we pay a total of $8,243. So the, ef the effective rate, that's why uh, APY, annual percentage U, is also called the effective rate. So effectively, you're paying 8.24%. So that is how you would compute the annual percentage U. Now, that's quite a long-winded way to compute annual percentage yield. There is a shortcut. So if you don't want to go through the entire calculation process, you can simply use this shortcut formula. So some definition, APR is the annual rate. This is typically the rate that is dated. M here is the compounding frequency per year. So it basically is how many times is interest computed per year. So if we're doing it on a monthly basis, then M will be 12 because there are 12 months per year. If we're doing it on a quarterly basis, then M will be 4 because there are 4 quarters per year. So let's take a look at our last example. In our last example, we have... 8% per year, so our 8% is the APR, and because it is quarterly compounding, that makes M 4 because there are 4 quarters per year. So if you use this formula, we have to convert all the percentages to decimals, so it becomes 1 plus 0.08, 8% becomes 0.08, divided by 4, 
to the power 4 minus 1. And you can just put this into your calculator. Uh, just a word of uh, order of operation. Division goes first and then everything inside the bracket. So that will become uh, 1 plus 0 0.02 to the power 4 minus 1. So it's 1.02 to the power 4 minus 1. In this case, you'll need your uh, calculator. Uh, 1 0.02 to the power 4 turns out to be 1.0824 minus 1, and that is 0 0.0824 or 8.24 percent, which is exactly the answer that we get when we walk through, compute all the interest per year, and then derive the APU, APY that way. Uh, you can try out another example. Let's say you have an AP. R, a new percentage of 24%, and the compounding frequency is monthly, and so it's 12 times per year. Uh, you can go through the calculation and see if you get 26.82%. So it's always good to practice. If you don't get the right answer, make sure you check your order of operation. So uh, because it's 22%, 24% divided by 12, so you should get 1.02 to the power 12 minus 1, and that will give you exactly 26.82%. Um, Next, let's take a look at APR. APR is actually the uh, interest rate that is required to be disclosed by law. So um, this is the one, this is the interest rate that is um, legally required. Um, the idea behind the law and the requirement is to provide a, a consistent basis for presenting interest rate. Um, and the goal is to help protect consumers uh, because a lot of times there are additional terms added to the loan that is not directly an interest but is a cost to consumer. Uh, however, the moment the law was passed, Financial institutions created more and more costs that, uh, that are new uh, to circumvent um, APR. So you still have to be careful when you take out a loan. So legally, the APR required by law is to take all the, int all the fees associated with the loan. Uh, so these are direct fees. So again, pay attention because the loan may have additional costs that are not technically consider fees under the legal definition. So interest, as the name implied, this is the total interest paid over the life of the loan. Um, and then we divide it by the principal. Principal is the loan amount that is stated in the contract. Um, and here is the number of days in the long term multiplied by 360 because there are 365 days in a year, and then multiply it by 100 because uh, to convert a decimal into a percentage. So uh, there were a lot of um, problematic loans before the passage of Regulation Z, which is a long time ago. Um, and under, after Regulation Z is passed, um, the Federal Reserve actually create the APR tables. Uh, if you are interested, you can click on the link to uh, look at what the, how, uh, what the APR is for a particular loan type. With the knowledge that you have gained from the time value of money module, you can actually do your own estimate of what the true cost of borrowing is. And the key in there is regardless of what language and term that it brought, uh, uh, a lender use, what you really need to ask them is, how much money will I have to pay you back at what time, at what frequency, and then also, um, what is the actual amount that you're going to give me today? Uh, those are the key questions to ask. Um, in fact, when you see a lot of advertising, some, sometimes they are questionable, sometimes they may not be questionable, but you will see if you're in advertising, they will always advertise the monthly payment. It ranges everything from cars to dental work is only $150 a month. But if they don't tell you how many months you have to make that payment, that makes a huge difference. If you are making $150 per month for one year versus two years, that's huge. 
And there's a reason why they don't give you the full disclosure of the term, because if you have all the information, you can figure out your own true cost of borrowing. Let's take a look. So I said that the first thing you, you need to determine is the actual initial balance and take and you need to take into account all the costs and fees associated with that so if someone say you can take a loan for five hundred dollars but then there is a twenty dollar fee uh, and then there's another thirty dollar uh, courier fee that will be deducted and you only get three hundred and fifty dollars or they'll say the loan amount is four hundred dollars but we have this other fee that we're going to tack on but don't worry you don't have to pay it and when they compute the interest, instead of basing the interest on $400, they now add all those fees on top of the $400 loan and that your initial balance is actually $450, not $400. So the key here is to ask all those detailed questions and take all the costs associated with taking out the loan into your account. And then the second part is your actual repayment. And the third is very important, how many payments do you have to make all together? So it seems like a pretty basic question, but when you look at a lot of loan and consumer product advertisement, they don't give you those three things. Let's take an uh, actual example and walk through how that may work. Let's say you have, uh, you, look, you look at a loan and the loan is for just $100. So very low loan. And the interest rate is 20% with 12 payments. So let's walk through how a lender may compute this. So the lender may say is 20% on $100. So 20% is 0.2, 20% on $100 is $20. So they figure out you owe $100 plus $20 in interest. So that's $120. You have 12 payments, so it's $10 per month. That seems reasonable so far. And you can use the time value of money tool, which is the fine rate to compute this. Um, the APR but using your own calculation is 35.07%. If you look at the financial reserve table, the APR is 35%. So they are very, very close. So as a reminder, how would you compute this um, true cost of borrowing? So remember, you can use the fine rate tool. So this is the number of period or amper in our time value of mon money tool. Uh, the payment is $10, those are your PMT, and we will make that n a negative number. Uh, the $100 is the present value. And to find the interest rate, we're going to use the rate function. And the input will be the number of periods, payment, and present value. And the answer you get is the monthly interest rate. So it's 2.92% per month because there are 12 months per year. You multiply that by 12 and you get 35.07%. Now you have a deep understanding of annual percentage yield and annual percentage rate. Again, the most important question when you are borrowing or taking out a loan or buying anything on financing is to ask these three very critical questions. What are the, all the costs associated with a loan initially, the actual payment per period, and the number of total payments? Now let's take a look at other interest rate characteristics. Some interest rate or some loan products or investment are fixed rate, others are variable rate or floating rates. Fixed rate will remain fixed and constant throughout the entire loan period. Um, a fixed rate mortgage or a fixed rate car loan are the most common example for investment. A certificate of deposits oftentimes are fixed rate. Uh, government bonds oftentimes are also fixed rate. Variable rates are tied to a benchmark and the benchmark is important. So when the benchmark rate changes, so does the interest rate on your loan. Uh, common examples are adjustable rate mortgage, equity line credit, a particular credit card, those are oftentimes uh, are subject to change.
The most common benchmark rate is called a prime rate. The prime rate is the interest rate that bank charges their most favorite customer. So most uh, variable rate products are quoted as prime plus. So for example, if the credit card interest rate is 20% plus prime, that means whatever the prime rate is your credit card interest is 20 percent higher than that so if the prime rate is six percent then your credit card interest rate is 26 percent so again the prime rate is the lowest rate the largest bank charges their largest customer so typically consumers do not receive the prime rate it may seem pretty obvious that an individual investor, of course, will not get the best deal from the bank and the reason is well why is that uh, in fact, all interest rate change differences can be related to some kind of risk factor. So the rule of thumb is that the higher the risk, a, uh, a consumer uh, will have to pay a higher interest rate. Uh, this rule actually not just applies to loans, it also applies to investments. So if you invest in a higher risk security, you would expect to get a higher return. On the other hand, if you pose a higher credit default risk, meaning that you, you, you have a high chance of not being able to pay your loan, then the banks will charge you a higher interest rate. And we'll talk about credit score in details uh, in our future module, uh, but your credit score is a proxy for how risky you are as a uh, borrower. In addition to risk, there are additional factors that affect interest rates. So let's look at these uh, basic factors. Uh, in general, we can look at interest rate as it has two components. You have a risk-free component and then a risk premium. The risk-free component is the interest rate that the lowest risk borrower, which in our example is typically US government, will have to pay. And then um, the risk premium is the addition that, we that the bank charges uh, the borrower depending on their specific individual risk. So the risk-free rate, in theory, nothing in life is risk-free, but uh, the most common proxy is the three months treasury bill. So again, this is the safest investment you can get. This is the treasury bill by the US government. So what affects the three month T bill? Uh, inflation is an important factor. High inflation oftentimes uh, correlate with higher interest rate. And then the other is supply and demand for money. So if the economy is going strong, there's a lot of demand for money from the industry and businesses, interest rate will go up. Um, the same thing when the economy is doing well, individuals may want to borrow money, buy houses, buy cars, buy appliances. Again, that would drive up the demand of money. When it comes to the risk-free portion, um, it has um, several characteristics. Uh, we'll talk about the four major ones. Uh, the first one is um, people's perception of risk averse. So again, when people have high confidence, you may have hear, hear the term consumer confidence or um, uh, manage, management confidence. When people have confidence in the economy, they are willing to take more risk. And if they are more willing to take risk, they are less risk averse and they will demand a lower premium for taking risk. And then the other is the specific risk of the borrower. So the first part, the market participants risk averseness, this is a general risk perception in the market. The second is the specific risk of the borrower. So when people have high confidence and you have low default risk, you have a lower risk premium. Uh, the other two are maturity risk. This has to do, maturity is the uh, length of the investment. The longer the length of the investment, so a 30-year mortgage versus a five-year car loan, the 30-year mortgage is a longer term and therefore we have a higher risk. Um, another type of risk is liquidity risk. Liquidity refer to your ability to sell off your either a, a stock or, an, or a mutual fund or an investment or to liquidate a loan, meaning to pay off the loan uh, and convert that into cash quickly, that is liquidity. So the more liquid something, so you can think of, um, for example, a, um, 
a large company stock, uh, a well-known stock, uh, say a Google stock or uh, a GM stock, that will be easy to sell uh, compared to a plot of land in the middle of Ming um, that has no road access. Uh, that would be pretty difficult to sell. So the plot of land in Ming with no road access will have a high liquidity risk. The final uh, item is tax factor. Uh, income on different securities are taxed differently and they'll affect the interest rate on those products. To conclude, there is no free lunch. So remember there's always a trade-off between risk and return. So if you uh, encounter an investment that promises very high return with low risk, that is probably something that is too good to be true and you need to look into it carefully. Um, we talk about efficiency in the stock market, and this is definitely beyond the scope of this one uh, module. Uh, but what we need to know in general is that in real life, the financial markets are highly competitive. So free lunch is very hard to come by. So the, uh, in general, investors that have limited wealth or as a lower income or even median median income, they are not as well suited to invest in high risk security, even though the high return can be very attractive because any downside risk uh, can be detrimental to someone who has limited wealth. So the bottom line is that there is no free lunch. There should always be a trade-off between risk and return. And if something is too good to be true, they definitely are when it comes to investments. We will conclude this module here. I'll see you soon in the next module.